Uh, anyway, so I have uh, chapter 11. Um, this is called greedy search methods. Um, the, the learning objectives. So I, tr I really tried hard, Federica, to actually make, a, make some notes. Um, and, and I think, I, I think I, I'm reasonably successful, but not probably perfectly successful. But so there's a new data set that we're dealing with. It's Parkinson's uh, disease data. Um, and, and then we'll talk about uh, simple filters and then recursive feature elimination, which is RFE. Let me make this, let me blow this up a bit bigger. <clears throat> and, then, and then we'll talk very briefly about stepwise selection, which the authors hated um, pretty much. It's, they talked about it, there's no code for it, and they pretty much said, don't do it. But we'll explain why um, as we get through it. So the, uh, the data set for, for today's chapter is Parkinson's disease data. So they had the patient speak uh, a specific sound three times, and then they did signal processing, audio signal processing to pull out 750 numerical features of that data. Um, and what that data looks like is uh, uh, very, it's just tons and tons of numbers. Um, this is the training data set. I'll talk about what that means in just a second, but you can see that all these little, uh, all these little, all these features here along the way, and there's just tons and tons of them. What exactly, I, I'm not in sound processing, so I don't exactly know what those represent uh, in any way, but um, the, the idea is that there's a, t a bunch of different variables that they pulled out from a relatively small phenotype in terms of uh, the interpretation of of one spoken word. Um, <clears throat> so they had uh, they they pulled a stratified random sample of twenty five percent of the data, uh, which represents one hundred and eighty nine patients, one hundred and thirty eight with Parkinson's. So it's very heavily, uh, I guess, skewed towards people with Parkinson's in terms of their their actual output data, um, and We'll talk a little bit about that later, but not not a ton more other than you know just to say that it's uh, it's pretty heavily skewed towards those with Parkinson's. Um, so the 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 first the first main part of the chapter is about uh, simple filters, um, and and they describe this as kind of a reasonable approach, uh, you know, first off approach to 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 the, to figuring out which variables have the highest predictive power in your data set. I had a really hard time with the way that they kind of structured it in the book in terms of like um, the way they the way they kind of represented the the different uh, outcomes versus predictors, like how they split this all out. Um, I redid it into kind of this 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 uh, bullet point list where you have a, a categorical outcome. If your predictor is categorical, you, you with two levels, you can use odds ratios, three levels, a contingency table with a chi-square test. If you have an outcome that's categorical and your predictor is continuous, you can, with two levels, you can do a t-test with three levels, a categorical ANOVA and the F statistic. If your outcome is continuous, it's, it's essentially the same as up here with categorical and continuous, except for you, they said that you just flip it. Um, if the predictor is continuous and the outcome is predict is continuous, then you can do pairwise or rank correlation, so like a linear model, or you can use nonlinear statistics. Um, and here's where I, I know what a GAM is, but I don't I didn't really I don't know what MIC or A statistic is. Does anybody want to add a little bit to that in terms of what those what those statistical tests are? I'm looking at maybe Federica or Ricardo. <laughs> Who usually chime in on these things? <laughs> I don't know what MIC is, and yeah, I don't that, know what that, the A statistic that one, is. That, that one is new to me, so uh, okay. Yeah. You always find something new, right? Yeah, <laughs> but I know what a GAM is, a right. general additive model, and yeah, models, uh, yeah. and and it's uh, as uh, as some of the people that I follow on Twitter or used to follow on Twitter say that it's a it's a squiggle. So there's a there's a spline function to it. Um, now, what they're saying here is that you know these are all like, these are all the they all the combinations. You have a categorical outcome, uh, a predictor's categorical or continuous. The outcome is continuous, or you have a categorical or a continuous predictor. 
but you know if you take these one at a time that's great you know that's great but real data is extremely complex on complex it's complicated you'll have mixtures of all these variables and combinations uh within a data set um and you know how do you how do you then know what's what's important because uh, in, and they mentioned in, in many cases, the scales of the output st statistics are, are often different. And so they're not easily comparable. Um, and then they say, well, we can convert them to a P value and go from there. And, and, and then I said, well, and we usually do. Um, and then the P value obviously, or maybe not so obviously is, uh, uh the chances of there being no association. So like, uh, um, less than 5% chance of that happening we usually say that that's that means that there probably is an association so um converting to p-values uh, many many tests output p-values as kind of standard um, it's fairly routine but some tests are not easily translated so they they brought up the AO, auc curves uh, where you have a categorical feature and a continuous outcome um, and they said the way that they get around this is they they um, use a permutation method where they they keep the um, the let me see let me get this right the outcome predict the outcome stable and they randomly permute the the uh, and sample the uh, predictor against that and then they say well okay you have that distribution where something is significant or not. And you say, well, where does my actual data fall in that in that profile? And then that can be converted into a p-value and therefore you can kind of sneak around that uh, through permutation. Um, yeah, so that's, so tip, but typically, you know, most of the models that, that I've ever dealt with, there's some way to convert it into some sort of p-value so that you know that that particular predictor uh, outcome combination is is important and that's what we're talking about today the, the 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 biggest issue that they said with there were a couple of different issues that they said with simple filters but the big one was like um they're an easy first step but the filters can uh show a strong association in the training data but then not um not not in the test data um, or or new data um, when they when they see these are called false positive variables. Um, you can use cross validation and resampling techniques to reduce carrying forward a false positive variable. Um, but what what happens is is that if you if you start to use cross validation sort of techniques or resampling techniques, you start to run into a wall in terms of its um, in terms of like how many models you need to do and so they i, I just uh, ripped this out of the book it's uh, it's their it's just a link to their picture actually um you start to do internal resamples times external resamples times the tuning parameters and you just blow up the number of models that you need to evaluate uh very very quickly in order to make sure that you don't carry forward these false positive variables okay so um, back to the Parkinson's disease data a little bit. Um, let me blow this back up again. Um, the predictors, if if you if you look at them back in back in R, um, actually you can't see it. But anyway, they're 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 highly multicollinear. The sample size itself, remember, is 189 people out of the the sample that we've taken in the training data. And the outcome is in balance. So 75%-ish uh, patients have the disease. Um, and they, they, they run the model. Um, it's a PLSDA. So uh, um, let me get to it. It's figure 11.3 in the, in the book. Um, and what they do is the PLSDA model uh, is run with the, all of these, with, with the simple feature reduction techniques that they talk about in the book. Um, I would share some of the code, but it's, it's um, I don't know, it's, it, it's hard to just read it. Um, but anyway, what they did here is they, uh, the PLSDA output like four main variables. And here they're looking at, um, uh, they're, they're looking at just kind of the, the combination of those variables and how correlated they are. 
Um, and so the the main thing here is that uh, this particular type of model, the, the PLSDA model, can handle multicollinear data quite well. Um, and it's like a, I don't know, I'm probably gonna say this wrong, but from my understanding, PLS and PCA are very similar techniques in the way they kind of work. They were their dimension reduction techniques. And the DA part of PLS is, is about, you give it um, kind of another variable to, to, to try and separate. And in this case, they gave it the Parkinson's, non-Parkinson's um, outcome. And then they went through all the variables using the simple feature selection, trying to trying to put all those, trying to eliminate as much as possible. I kind of don't understand why they did that though, because if the PLSDA model can actually reduce the data set down, why why would you need to reduce the data set down before you the model does it? I, and I don't know if anybody has any insight there that I missed. Uh, I would sure appreciate um, you chiming in if you do. Uh, just thinking about uh, Brandon, you, you are correct. Uh, the PCA and the PLS, uh, they they have a they have a common uh, what is called a common uh, approach, right? Uh, to dimensionality reduction in terms of the eigenvectors, etc. But the PLS, of course, is super supervised. PSA is unsupervised, right? Okay. So if this case is a supervised, because we have the target, which is if you are Parkinson or not, uh, we have to see. I don't know if they mention it, okay? Because I haven't I haven't read all, all this, but I don't know if they have mentioned how much variance does the PLS model accumulate within the number of components, okay? Because as we have seen before using PSA, sometimes you get a reduced number of principal components that get you, let's say 80, 85% of the variance, which is good. But then some other circumstances, you have a lot of principal components. So you are in the same, you know, you, you, you are in the same place that you began. So one of the things maybe that they tried was, okay, if it's not covering that much, the PLS, because of the nonlinear relationships and you know what, 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 whatever reason, then maybe they're using the simple filter to try to aid the model. In other words, reduce those variables and then aid the model to get the more reduced uh, set of components. I mean, we're well, thinking out loud. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I really don't know if that's why you know, they explain it that way. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate that insight because I actually, uh, I don't remember them explaining <laughs> which, I know they're not called principal components, but the PLS components, whatever they're called, right. uh, how much variation, like a scree plot, right? Where, the, how right. much variation yes. they describe. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't yeah, remember seeing that. Yeah, because for, for, for example, in the PSA, and I did, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think Federica was there, you know, uh, in one of the meetups in, in, in my hometown, Orlando, uh, we did some PSA because, you know, I, I, I got the motivation because of this book, because they use a lot of PCA. So uh, one of the things that happened, you know, and I made it on purpose, is that the problem that we were uh, studying with PCA it didn't accumulate that much variance, okay? The first component was about, let's say 10%, and the other was 8%. So you got only, in two components, you got only 8%. So even though maybe PSA is not the way to, to go, you know, attacking that, that situation, but it tells you something. And it tells you that there's a lot of nonlinear relationships, okay, that PCA cannot capture. Because PCA, one of the assumptions, like linear regression, is that you have to have linearity. In the in, in in the in the relationship between those variables, so it's telling you something, okay, and you can use that then for further further analysis. There you go. Yeah, actually, that's really true. I don't think PLS does PLS handle nonlinear relationships that well either. I don't remember, but I, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I don't think because the math assumes like PA assumes that linear. the components are linearly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> okay. So one of the things yeah. that they point. Go ahead, Frederica. 
there is even uh, something else to think about is the uh, when to apply the filters if uh, within so before the pre-processing after the pre-processing uh, before the modeling after so um the, the resampling so um uh, i'm sure they tried uh different ways to see uh, which one uh, releases the best result? So I was going to uh, say there. There to answer a little bit of your question, maybe the the recipe is uh, here. Um, yeah. It's uh, they did the Yayo Johnson, then they'd yeah. centered and scaled stuff before uh, before before feeding that into the model training. Um, mm -hmm. And so. This is the pre-processing part, and then uh, the the um, assign with some uh, metrics, and and then uh, they did the the the, the um, resampling thing, and then they filtered, and there was uh, something in the introduction of this uh, two chapter I mentioned in the last. The last time that um, you you need to think about when apply yeah, yeah, yeah. the order yeah the order uh, and this is the case when they did it after uh, afterwards and so uh, after the the resampling thing and um, um, why uh, I'm sure that the Ricardo has the the the, the most appropriate thing about the amount of variation uh, which is uh, included in the in the data so uh, do you know if that's in like the model object or something like that like is that something we could easily see <clears throat> like this is the output from that from that simple filter yeah. um, I even try the... to, to visualize this result yeah i didn't i didn't really either an awful an awful result so i've used this uh, uh sensitivity this one minus specificity and sensitivity as you can see there is a number of, of computation that you have we have 20 so each each one is uh it's uh, we have the a under the curve or, There's a number uh, of components. That was the uh, yeah. uh, what did you call that? Yeah, uh, that's the tuning parameter, one of the tuning exactly. parameters, uh, and then the red, and then these are the outputs mm -hmm. of the model. But I what I don't see here, at least superficially, is like the the other tuning parameter underneath this, where you have the fil filtering of the variables that don't matter. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know where I don't know where that went actually, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So okay, we'll 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 proceed. Um, so um, <clears throat> just to summarize simple filters real quick. Um, oh, you can tell my uh, my markdown didn't quite work. Uh, using a simple filtering screen prior to modeling. So this is before modeling can be effective and relatively efficient. Um, the filters should be included in the resampling process to avoid that false positive variable carrying forward. Um, but this can lead to redundancy in selected features too. So if you, in this case, you can you can get rid of something and then you can bring something back in. If you're using PCA or PLS, um, the, the redundancy thing came in when they were talking about, let's say you had three variables that were A, B, and C, and they were correlated uh, with each other one time based upon the sampling, it may select A is the one that go, or, or sorry, A is the one to go forward and getting rid of the other two. And in another sampling scenario, it may select C and get rid of A and B. And so actually A and C end up in the final model. And that's not really appropriate because those are, they're also, they're, they're collinear as well. So like um, you can get some redundancy in that way. Um, and then the filtering threshold itself is somewhat subjective. 
it's it's uh and so you can have some unknowns as to how many features you really should remove or not um and and so that's where your trained eye i guess comes in and that's why you all get paid the big bucks okay are you ready should we move on to recursive feature elimination um so the way this works is that it's like they build the model with everything in it um and then they and then they you know develop an important score for each predictor and then the least important ones are removed usually there's some are somewhat artificial threshold here as well and then the models rebuilt and then they examine that how well that model fits things um one call out they had really early on in the chapter was that not all models can be used with rfe and some benefit more from it than others um, uh, because it requires um, the model to use the full predictor set and when you have so in our case we have 189 rows in and then the p is 750 so we we have way more p than n um, and some models hate that um, so uh, and and what are those models? Those uh, uh, multiple linear regression, logistic regression, and uh, LDA. Um, and I already said that, so that's a typo, and I'll fix that afterwards. Uh, random forests can handle the multicollinearity, as as can some some of the other models. Um, but the selection of important variables um, can vary based upon the sample split. So this is actually what I was describing earlier, where like you can end up with a situation where both A and C, even though they're the same rough variable, if you were to do a PCA, they might come out in the same bucket um, in terms of like the uh, the scores plot or whatever. Um, you can end up with both in the final model if uh, depending on your sampling. Um, I didn't say a whole lot about that actually. Um, I don't have a lot more on recursive feature elimination. Um, there was a there was a significant amount of code in the in the chapter for it, um, and it looks very similar to the code in the in the previous in the previous section in terms of like its layout and everything. Um, but they ran it on this data set and seemed to seem to do a pretty good job of it uh, overall. Um, I feel like I'm missing something there though. Did I skip over a bunch? Apologies if I did. That was the, the, the replication of things. And then this is kind of the performance in terms of the number of variables and the uh, random forest important score and the rock score. Um, yeah, that, 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 that one is uh, even interesting, uh, the one above, if you, uh, yeah, because it shows you uh, how many variables and how the model changes uh, when increasing the number of variables. And as you can see, the, uh, can, you, can you scroll even, uh, uh, okay, so, um, uh these are the the, the oranges um point line is all variables while the the, the bluish uh, is they are filtered so as you can see with with this this all variables the 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 two models are quite the, performing as the same as each other so uh it might be uh, it, so the, the, the filtering uh, shows you um, a bit of, uh, um, what, what would you say about that? Better results for, for the, uh, yeah. I, I, I looked at this graph and I was a little confused by it because like, it seems like you're giving up a lot by pre-filtering to me. The scores are a lot lower. Um, am I misinterpreting it? I like, don't know because here is a, a random forest important. Okay, this is random forest important, and the rocks 
score. So we are measuring the area under the curve based on the number of variables. So the area under the curve is uh, higher uh, if we use all variables, while it's lower if we do filtering. But um, you can see the difference within the two models somehow. So the two scores more than, the, you know. Um, uh, well, apologies. I, I apparently uh, skimmed over no, no, this that, a little too much. No, no. This is, uh, I was uh, uh, looking at that, and uh, I thought that was that was that was interesting because then I've tried the the simple filters uh, with the rocks. Uh, as I said, you know, so trying to visualize them. And I didn't uh, use this thing, but I've just made a rock cube with the, the, the uh, and it was quite a strange shape, like like that. It's not like the, the, the usual I expected the rock cube. And so, you know, I think these are quite like, trying things and uh, so you can see our, what the output is and uh, then decide within them which one would be the best. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't know what, what's gonna happen after <laughs> in, the, in the chapter. It's, uh, kind of it's kind of interesting too that when you get to one variable, the 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 scores are still quite high for all. Does does that imply that there's one variable that in this case accounts for a massive proportion is very predictive? I suppose is what this is saying. Just one variable, um, like this but, dot but, here. But it's the only one. <laughs> Sorry, so, Jim. It's the only one. So compared. I guess variable importance is is relative importance compared to the other ones in the model, right? Hmm. Uh, in a random forest, the variable importance is how many times that feature appears it in, comes up. in that. Yeah, how how often does it come up in trees? Yeah, how how frequently that feature. Uh, appears in the splits, yeah, <laughs> in the splits of each of, of the trees. Okay, yeah, yeah. and it has you know it 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 it, it uh, computes an average of that. Yeah. So but basically, it's like <coughs> it, it, it's one variable. So the the area under the curve is quite high for both scores, and then if you add more variables, you see that the more or less the area under the curve stays stable within uh, so you can even stop earlier with filtering but then if you do filtering you see that one variable is not enough and then it grows up to like uh, 30 like something like that uh, for the random forest score uh, and so uh, you need uh, about 100 for the rock score to to reach the same level, um, it's quite interesting. Um, uh, by the way, I just uh, posted in the chat uh, an alternative to RFE. Uh, one of the things that you know when when I was studying, uh, you know, early uh, earlier machine learning. I stumbled with the RFE. And one of the things that I noticed is that depending on the size of the data, let's say if you have 100,000 uh, observations, uh, let's say uh, 200 uh, features, okay? That, that's a, you know, that's a fairly size uh, data set. Uh, RFE uh, takes a long time, okay? It takes a lot of resources for that. So an alternative for RFE is that package that I posted, uh, Boruda. Okay, it uses random forest. Uh, I mean, you can change the engine, but it uses random forest uh, algorithm, tree-based algorithm. 
uh, is faster and it gives you more information in terms of which are the features that you should keep, which are the ones that are tentative, in other words, they're in the fence there. So you could, you know, you could try different experiments adding or 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 or, or removing. And then it gives you the ones that are that you, you should really even consider. Okay. And it uses the the fluid, Microsoft Fluid, uh, you know, color scheme, uh, green for pass, yellow for danger, and red for, you know, forget it. <laughs> that's that 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 that's gone. So it's, 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 very, it's very useful. I have, I have uh, used it uh, frequently, more than, <clears throat> excuse me, more than a, a, a RFE, okay? So uh, what, one, one good experiment to try is to try Boruda, okay? Because this book was written in around 2015, I think, and Boruda came later, <laughs> okay? So it, it was not in the, you know, it, 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 it was not released uh, yet. So we need to add to section or chapter eleven, adding a chapter on Baruta. I, I I think that in this in this particular case, you know, there could be an alternative. Okay, I don't know, you know, what the authors think about the package, but Baruta, you know, is very, uh, you know, it, it it appears a lot in the in the literature. Cool. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, and it's a, it's a straightforward, and it's an R, you know, the the implementation was first in uh, done in R. Then it, it went uh, to Python. Okay. Cool. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, have it in the radar always. Uh, Baruta. Very, very good. Very good package. <laughs> All right. Are we ready for section eleven point four? Um, I, as I say here, it's a very weird section. They explain it. Then there's no code accompanying accompanying it, and then they say, "Don't do it." <laughs> the end <laughs> so uh i'm going to explain it anyway how does it work um uh, you model every variable independently and then based upon some cutoff that you define you keep that variable you fix it you keep the best variable you fix it in the model in the next set of models and you do every variable with that variable and then do that again and you keep you, you just keep iterating through until you've gone through all of your all of your variables um and so the models the models that that go forward they they hypothetically have your your best predictors in them so why is stepwise selection ungood um it has two primary faults um you have the potential inflation of false positive findings so it uses repeated hypothesis tests um but the p values are unadjusted um, which leads to an overselection of features, so false positive findings. Um, and it's exacerbated when highly correlated predictors are present. And so in our particular data set, the multicollinear, the you know, the, the 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 correlation between variables is hugely like it's it's very high. Um, <clears throat> And then model overfitting. Um, the resulting statistics coming out of the model are, uh, you know, include parameter estimates and associated uncertainty, and are highly optimistic since they don't take into account the selection process itself. Um, but you know, one thing I notice here in this in this section is they say the model overfitting is a watch out on all the methods described here in eleven and in the next chapter. Um, the global search methods as well. So I thought I'd call that one out. So the stepwise selection example, they used um, uh, a log logistic regression model. We've actually talked about it before. I think it's the OKCupid okay one, or it is the OKCupid okay one, where they were trying to associate a binary variable of whether or not the person is Caucasian with the words that they used in an essay. Um, and they showed that the initial model is most effective with nerd, Firefly, I assume the TV show. And I'm maybe instant message. I don't know how old this data is. <laughs> Seems like that's pretty old. <laughs> Both the Firefly reference and the IM. Um, and and you know, the key is minimizing the AIC of the of the of the stepwise selection. Um, again, there was no code. With this, uh, there was no model evaluation or anything like that. There's there's no plots or anything to share. Um, um, but you know, I put it in bold here at the bottom. Their recommendation is to avoid the procedure altogether. 
Um, uh, Brandon, Brandon. Yeah. I, I, I think that was intentional that they didn't provide any code, you know. They don't want you to use it. That's all. They don't want you to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so don't, don't 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 get in any ideas. You know, we're not going to share any code because you know we don't we don't want you to look at it. So, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, I. Yeah, that's a that's a good call out because I think uh, right I think, uh, right. Yeah, we we, we don't want to tempt, the opportunity want to, to tempt copy you. the day. Right. Yeah. We don't want to tempt you onto you know using our code. You know when you are not recommending strongly. You know that you don't use it. So. <laughs> Yeah, because you might be one of those people that copies the code and doesn't read the book. Oh yeah. <laughs> so um, they uh, they mention at the at the very end they say regularization methods, um, GlimNet type models are are far better at selecting subsets of linear models or subsets in linear models, and they mentioned uh, the use of Bayesian methods that could uh, could work as well for that sort of stuff, um, and and that was that was it for the chapter actually um there... yeah, i remember that they said something about uh, that it is very computation expensive yeah because you got to do so many different models there's there's tons of them yeah. but you know i don't know if it's anything more than the one where you're doing resampling of uh the other models as well because uh like that I ran when I ran the uh, the very first one, the simple selection one, and I also ran the other one. And the second one took a really long time on my machine. It's not a fast machine or anything like that, but it's not terrible either. Um, but it did not take yeah. as long as some of the models that we did in the tidy modeling book. Like those, some of those were forever. Yeah, but you know, if if you have uh, um, a few predictors. You don't need all these procedures, so you can use stepwise selections, uh, and so it, you will achieve better results. You don't need to do many things, many of these things, uh, if you have just a few predictors. So this is the case when you have many predictors. So the next chapter is the global search methods. Um, I don't, I don't know who's going to do that one, but uh, there's some interesting things there with the Bayes models and whatnot. Um, do, do, do we have someone for the next time or no? Not yet, not yet. So is there any uh, one that would like to take the next chapter? Maybe we'll, we can no takers. Them. It's the last <laughs> one, right? Yeah, the last chapter. This Maybe book was really I quick, actually. It. I can volunteer. Okay, good. That's great. Thanks, Ethan. Mm -hmm. Is that next week, or is there another week off? Oh, because next week is uh, the regular. Uh, and this week? this last week was off because of just because of the time change, or okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I gotta tell you, I was confused today for sure. I uh, I put it in as GMT, and that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. I should have copied. I didn't realize. Uh, not that John wouldn't have done it, but I didn't realize John had a had a calendar for it. I should have just subscribed to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah, it, it, it is still a bit confusing because you need to add one hour to the um, to, to regular time. So even if in universal time, uh, it's, it's plus one. So okay, so great. Uh, thank you very much. That was interesting. Uh, uh, one, more, one more comment. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's not about, uh, you know, feature selection or anything like that. Uh, there was an announcement uh, this week that we're going to be uh, starting a new cohort for the time series, uh, forecasting a time series, okay? So, uh, uh, I don't know if Erika recommended, you know, that I, I will facilitate that, that cohort, I know, and I, I accept it. So, uh, I'm trying to see if we can continue this lot, okay? Because uh, 
you know, not not to not to break too much, you know, the, the weekends and also, you know, at the busy of the, of the weekdays. So uh, I, you know, my time is really one or two o'clock uh, p.m. Uh, Eastern time, Eastern time, <laughs> uh, standard time uh, uh, on Fridays. So if you are interested or motivated, you know, j jump in. Okay. Uh, the from Rob uh, Heinemann, Hein Hein uh, he's an Australian. And he that that's the book, you know, the 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 the, the most popular book in uh, academy uh, for studying uh, you know forecasting principles and all that. And it's a book that it has the theory and also has exercises. Okay. So in the last cohort, we, we didn't, you know, uh, finish it. Uh, what we did was that, you know, there was a day for theory, understanding the basic theory, and then the next session, we discussed some of the exercises. And that will give you a little bit of more practice, you know, in this in these matters. And as, you, and as you can see, you know, in business, time series is, is a must. Uh, you know, if, 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 if you are doing an interview or something, it, it will appear, time series will appear. So uh, it's good to have those, you know, those foundations in your in your toolkit. So every, everyone is welcome, you know, for that series. I, I believe it's going to start after, you know, we finish this one, okay? Maybe we'll take a, while, a week, you know, a week off and then, you know, uh, we jump in. Thanks yeah. for the invite. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Gonna be interesting. Okay. Good. So mm -hmm. anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. You Take too. Care. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.